For healthy humans, bile usually flows from the liver and into the small intestine. And this is a super important part of digestion and absorption of nutrients, right? When there isn't enough bile flowing between these two, we can say that there's some sort of cholestasis going on, because chola means bile and stasis means inactivity. This reduction in bile flow can basically be split into two types, hepatocellular cholestasis, where for some reason the hepatocytes aren't making enough bile, and obstructive cholestasis, where something's physically blocking the flow of bile. For hepatocellular cholestasis, which would be considered a form of intrahepatic cholestasis since it's happening inside the liver, a really important culprit is the hormone estrogen. Estrogen is thought to basically cause the hepatocytes to not be able to pump out bile acids, usually in the form of cholic acid, which is produced when hepatocytes break down cholesterol. And in this case, the hepatocytes literally can't pump out the cholic acid because it's been found that the estrogen inhibits the export pump that usually moves the bile acid from the hepatocyte to the bile caniculi, which leads to the bile ductules and eventually the common hepatic duct. But bile acids are just one component of bile, right? Wouldn't the bile still be made just without the bile acids? Well, production and secretion of bile acids is actually a major driving force for the synthesis of bile in the hepatocytes. So when the cells can't transport the bile acids and they start to build up inside the cell, this is basically a signal to downregulate bile acid synthesis and excretion of bile altogether, which decreases the total amount of bile production. When the excretion of bile components like conjugated bilirubin are down, but they're still being conjugated, they also build up along with the bile acids, and eventually it's thought that they diffuse or are exocytosed into the interstitial space, where it can access the blood supply. Since estrogen's been linked as a primary suspect here, it makes sense that we see hepatocellular cholestasis in situations where estrogen levels might be higher. Since oral contraceptive pills, or birth control pills, use estrogen and progesterone to stop ovulation, it also makes sense that they've been linked to developing cholestasis, right? Similarly, during pregnancy, estrogen levels can increase a lot, which can lead to pregnancy-induced cholestasis. But this typically isn't dangerous to the fetus or the mother. Anabolic steroids, like those used by athletes or bodybuilders, have also been linked to cholestasis. It's thought because they're similar in structure to estrogen, but the mechanisms aren't very well known. Another hepatocellular mechanism for cholestasis is related to newborns and is associated with neonatal hepatitis. In newborns, it's thought that several of the important mechanisms that help produce bile in hepatocytes are relatively immature leading to this overall decreased ability to produce bile. And this, in combination with the developing liver being more sensitive to injury, can lead to a reduction in bile synthesis and bile flow for newborns. The other major type of cholestasis is obstructive, which usually happens outside the liver, so we can call it extrahepatic cholestasis. Now this is usually a physical blockage of the common bile duct. It could be like a gallstone that came from the gallbladder, or it could be from a disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis, where the body's immune system actually attacks the bile ducts, causing inflammation and scar tissue in those ducts, which can make it more difficult for bile to flow through them. Biliary atresia is another condition just like sclerosing cholangitis, but this one specifically affects newborns. Finally, pancreatic carcinomas that grow at the head of the pancreas may also physically block the flow of bile, since the common bile duct moves through the head of the pancreas. This buildup of bile will be pretty obvious on histology of the liver, and will look like these bile lakes, or bile infarcts, which are these pools of yellowish-green bile that have made their way into the interstitial space and sort of pooled up there. If we look at the gross image of the liver, all this bile will cause it to take on this yellowish-green color. Now, a pretty common clinical finding of somebody with either hepatocellular or obstructive cholestasis is jaundice and pruritus. In obstructive cholestasis, the bile accumulates in the liver, right, and slowly seeps into the serum. This is because when those bile ducts are obstructed in some way, the pressure in the ducts increases, which causes bile to leak through the tight junctions between hepatocytes into the interstitial space and into the serum which would mean that the individual components of that bile will get into the serum as well, right? Conjugated bilirubin, therefore, will get into the blood, leading to the yellowed skin tone that's indicative of jaundice. Bile salts, another main ingredient of bile, 
can cause pruritus by depositing in and making the skin itchy and irritated. Not only that, cholesterol can also deposit in the skin and lead to these buildups called xanthomas. In hepatocellular cholestasis, remember that both bile salts and conjugated bilirubin are made, they're just not excreted as well and can leak out, leading again to pruritus and jaundice. Xanthomas, though, are not as characteristic for hepatocellular cholestasis, since bile isn't leaking through the tight junctions like it was for obstructive cholestasis. All right, so if the bile flow is blocked or reduced even, and is being rerouted everywhere except the small intestine, where it should be going, you also might expect a reduction in nutrient absorption from the small intestine, since bile usually helps emulsify fats and make them easier to absorb. Also, when bile gets into the small intestine, some of that conjugated bilirubin is converted by microbes in the gut to urobilinogen, which contributes to the brown color in stool. So if less bile and conjugated bilirubin is making it to the gut, then the stool will likely take on a much lighter color because it's got less urobilinogen. A fraction of that urobilinogen is reabsorbed and gets excreted in the urine, so there'll be less in the urine as well. Conjugated bilirubin excretion, though, will often be increased in the urine, since it's being excreted from the blood through the kidneys. This is also called bilirubinuria and will cause darker urine. Finally, enzymes that are usually found in the liver, like alkaline phosphatase, or AALP, and gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, or GGT, may also be found increased in the blood. Both of these enzymes are membrane-bound enzymes that are sensitive to hepatocyte damage and can be released when those hepatocytes are damaged or stressed in some way. These signs of cholestasis, whether they're from obstructive or hepatocellular, are super important to recognize so that the underlying cause of this reduced bile formation or reduced bile flow can be found and then the right treatment can be given.